Good morning. On this 4th of July, we pay tribute to Sergeant Ebenezer Coe, a revolutionary patriot who rests in our cemetery. Ebenezer took part in the siege of Boston and the Battle of Long Island, where he was taken prisoner by the British, but managed to escape. He moved to New Jersey, where he continued the fight for independence. As I lay this wreath, I honor and pray for his memory and others from New Vernon who supported the effort that formed our country.
nation. Listen for God's word coming to us in scripture. Our hearts and minds are open. I think we have our sound system sorted out now. Alex, our uh, AV person, is away on vacation, so we're managing with you and me on AV duty today. So before we hear the story, uh, you heard the kids' version in, uh, a couple minutes ago. What words would you all use to describe the person Moses? So who grew up watching the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston on TV? They used to air that every Easter weekend. So what words would you use to describe Moses? A leader? Brave. Hesitant. Faithful. Faithful. I won't put you on the spot anymore. We're going to read this story and then reflect on those words, reflect on the image of Moses that we hear and see in the cinema. This is a longer reading, but I'm going to try and get through it a little quicker. It said, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. I have come up to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. And I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be your sign, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What do I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And then Moses answered, But suppose they don't believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? Moses responded, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So Moses threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So Moses did. He grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand. So that they may believe the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you, do this. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. Moses did, and when he took it out, it was leprous and as white as snow. Then God said, Put your hand back into your cloak. And so Moses did, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they do not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second. And if they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, then you shall take some water from the Nile, 
Pour it out on dry ground, and the water that you take shall become as blood on the dry ground. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my God, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now, but I have spoken to you. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him again, Who is it who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to speak. But again Moses said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak fluently. Even now he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And we will teach you what to do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as your mouth for you, and you will serve God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And what kind of words would you use to describe Moses in that story? You didn't respond the first time, so I'll assume you're thinking quietly in your head. Maybe timid, <laughs> reluctant, lacking in confidence, really doesn't want to do this. Moses did not want to free the Hebrew slaves. He came up with every possible excuse to try and get out of this job. Nobody's going to believe me if I go to the Pharaoh and say, let these people go. But God says, I'll be with you. Perform these miracles. Turn your staff into a snake. Make your hand leprous and clean. If they don't believe that, take water from their holy river, the Nile. Pour it out, it will become blood. That will surely convince the Egyptians that God is with you. Moses said, I still don't think they're going to believe me. These things sound great when you're saying them. But if I show up and say God was talking to me in a burning bush... They're going to think, I'm crazy. God said, well, tell the Israelites, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Tell them my holy name. I am who am. Surely they'll believe that. Moses says, well, they might, but I'm no good at public speaking. I'm slow to think, slow on my feet. And God <laughs> says, well, guess who gave you that mouth? Guess who taught you to speak? I will be there, I'll whisper in your ear what to say, and you just repeat after me. And Moses realizes that no matter what he says, no matter what he does, he's not going to be able to weasel his way out of this with excuses. And so he comes clean and says, God, just send somebody else. And we get this really poignant verse. It says, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Now, how many people can relate to this? You have been patient. You have tried to answer every problem, every excuse, every reason why your child, your coworker, maybe your husband or wife can't do something for you. But they just aren't budging. You can't make it happen. Maybe you think to yourself, or maybe you even say to them, if I could find anybody else to do this, anybody at all, I would not be standing here talking to you right now. But here we are. And at that point, you have a couple options. You can cut your losses and try to find somebody else or just do it yourself. Or you can do your best and make it work. And what we see is God decides on the latter. Well, what about your brother Aaron, God says. I know he's a really good public speaker. And he's on his way here. Why don't the two of you go together? He can talk. You can do the miracles. And I will help both of you. And with that, Moses agrees to go. Now, what do you think was going through Moses' head during this whole exchange? Maybe he was thinking back to the years he spent in Egypt, growing up in the Pharaoh's palace, 
enjoying luxury while all of his fellow Israelites were suffering beyond the walls of the palace compound. Maybe he was remembering the day he murdered an Egyptian slave master and was worried about retribution if he returned to that country. Maybe he was genuinely doubtful that he, Moses, could actually make a difference in this situation. He's not a good public speaker. He's not confident. He has no title, no degree, and the biggest thing is he has no army to back him up if things go wrong. Nobody would blame Moses for being skeptical about this mission. And maybe you felt like that at some point. Maybe there is a job that needs doing, and in an ideal world, it would be anybody but you. Maybe you just don't have the time for it. Maybe it's something that you know is going to be messy, and you don't want to get involved. Maybe you aren't sure it's possible. It's possible for you for anyone else. Situations like that are where miracles happen. A path forward appears in a place that we'd never imagined. Someone appears out of the blue to help us. We find ourselves doing something that we never imagined possible for us before. It may not happen immediately or all at once, but our history is full of stories about coincidences that are maybe a little bit more than a coincidence. You probably remember I was away for two weeks leading a retreat in Iona, Scotland, in an abbey that was rebuilt by the Iona community during the 1930s and 40s. And the founder of the Iona community is George McLeod. He's one of these larger-than-life figures that has many stories around his personality and about the rebuilding of the 12th century abbey there. One of his most famous sayings is, if you think that was a coincidence, may you lead an incredibly dull life. And there are a couple stories about the rebuilding of the abbey that illustrate this. One is that during World War II, bombing on London made it nearly impossible to get the materials they needed to continue the project. So George was shipping trainee ministers out to this island on the Scottish coast to rebuild the abbey alongside masons and uh, day workers. So in those days, uh, ministers were from the um, elite tier of society, and George thought that these boys in their ivory towers and their suits and ties knew very little about the lives of the people that they were actually ministering to in their communities, especially in the Rust Belt of Glasgow. And so his idea was to hire a bunch of out-of-work masons and carpenters to rebuild the abbey and to send the ministers there to work alongside them. And his idea was that the ministers had a lot to learn from these blue-collar workers about the value of a hard day's work, and that these tradesmen had a lot to learn from the ministers about prayer and faith. And it ended up working really well, but there was a time during the war when they couldn't get these materials, and they needed timber for the abbey ceilings. And it just so happened that one day, a storm came up in the North Sea, and a Swedish ship sailing for Canada had to jettison all of its cargo to avoid sinking in the storm. And what washed up on the shores across from Iona were these 50-foot timbers that were exactly what they needed to rebuild the ceiling in the abbey. George would tell this story, and he would say, if you think that's a coincidence, you must live a very dull life. Near the end of the abbey's completion, one of his patrons took him to the showing of a silversmith named Omar Ramsden in Glasgow. He's one of the most famous uh, silversmiths in the world at that time. And he said, George, I want you to pick out a piece to stand in the abbey for you all to use. So George went into the show and was looking around at communion cups and other things. But while he moved from table to table looking at Ramsden's pieces, he kept looking over at this giant silver cross that was clearly the biggest and most expensive item in the show. 
And he didn't want to ask for that right away, so he pretended to be interested in these smaller pieces as he worked his way around. And finally, the man who was there to purchase the item for the abbey said, well, George, get on with it. We all know you want that cross. Let's just go ask how much it costs. So they went up to the woman who was running the show. It was Ramsden's widow because he had died at that time. And they asked about the cross, and she said, oh, no, that is not for sale. We can't sell you that piece. My husband promised me that one day that cross would stand in Iona Abbey. And with that, they took the cross and put it in the church, and it's still there today. And if you think that's a coincidence, may you leave a very dull life. This same spirit is reflected in our sacramental theology as a church. In just a few minutes, we're going to share bread and juice together during communion. In and of themselves, there's nothing special about this bread or the grape juice. They came from a shelf in ShopRite or King's. Unless you didn't bake it, did you? No. But as Christians, we believe that despite the fact that these are just ordinary bread and juice, they are able to communicate something holy to us, something about God. And we believe that God is really present in that sacrament to us. This bread and this juice are the ordinary things of this world, which God makes special. That is what God did through Moses, and it is what God does through us. Each of us is called by God to do something. Our calling may evolve and change over time, but each of us has a part to play in God's ministry where we are. This weekend, as we reflect on our history as a nation, as we remember the many challenges that we've overcome in the past, and think about the challenges that we face today. My prayer is that we might all watch closely for the burning bushes in our lives, for God's invitation to do something new, something challenging, and believe that through God, all things really are possible.
will you join me in affirming our faith together using the words that are printed in the bulletin? We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth, to the place of death. On the third day he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and eternal life. Amen. <coughs> So this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It's to be made ready for those who love God and for those who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. Come, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time. Come, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come not because I invite you, but because it is our Lord. And it's God's wish that those who seek would meet God here. Now let's hear the story of how the sacrament began. On the night on which he was betrayed and as they were sitting at a meal, Jesus took a piece of bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Eat of it, all of you. Later, after they had eaten, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new relationship with God made possible by my death. Drink of it, all of you, to remember me. So now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this cup, the ordinary things of this world which God will make special. And as they said a prayer before sharing them, let us pray as well. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give both thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, our creator and guardian. Throughout history and many and various ways you have spoken to us. And in Jesus Christ we meet you face to face. In your grace and mercy all are welcome here. You prepare a table before us and the cup of blessing overflows. Therefore, we praise you, joining the song of the Universal Church and the Heavenly Choir, as together we sing. Let us continue our prayer. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and this cup and fill them with the fullness of Jesus, letting that same Spirit rest on us, 
converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. Among friends gathered around the table, Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took a cup. He said, this cup is the new relationship with God made possible by my death. Drink of it, all of it. He who the universe could not contain meets us in this bread. He who knows you and calls you by name meets us in this cup. These are the things of God for the people of God. Will you please come forward? We'll begin with this song.
Please join me in prayer. Generous God, we thank you for the many blessings we enjoy as members of your family. This morning, we are especially thankful for your words of challenge, calling us to reflect on our faith and how it impacts our lives today. Lord, hear our prayers of thanksgiving and accept our offering this morning as a token of our gratitude and as a sign of our commitment to share your love, your joy, and your hope with the world. We ask now that you would hear our prayers for ourselves and for others. We pray for those who on this holiday weekend are traveling. May they have patience and safety on their journeys. And may those who encounter trouble along the way find help and support quickly. As we look forward to the 4th of July, we remember the many people who have died in service to our country and the ideals upon which it was founded. We also recognize that for some people, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness still feel a long way off. Bless the leaders of our government, both here in New Jersey and in the United States. Give them wisdom as they make difficult decisions, patience when they encounter conflict, and hearts for justice as they look after the people and resources of our country. As we reflect on the many blessings we enjoy as Americans, we pray for the many places around our world suffering from violence and unrest. For Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Libya, Afghanistan, and Yemen. We pray that your peace might come to these places and more, Lord, and that it would come swiftly. And Lord, we pray for our church family and for those dear to us. We remember them and name them now in the silence. Hear these our prayers, Lord, and hear us as we join our voices together in the prayer that your Son, our Savior, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Joseph, before we hear you play the last hymn, I want to say a word of thanks and blessing to you and to Reed for all that you have brought to our church family over the last year. 
So I've known you for 15 years since I was a seminarian uh, down at Princeton and worked with you at Mountainside Church. And it was a great joy to all of us when you came to serve as the organist and director of music ministry here at New Vernon. You helped get our children's choir off the ground and running. You have hosted beautiful concerts from the Lessons and Carols program in the winter to the spirituals concert we have this spring. And every week you're playing on the organ and the gifts of the choir that you direct are a blessing and a great enrichment to our worship. And it's very hard for us to say goodbye to you today uh, as you play your final pieces with us. We are sad to see you go. But we also know that as you become the director of music at St. Peter's University, this is a big step up for you and a wonderful opportunity as well. And we send you with our blessings and every good wish as you start this new chapter in life and you have a new house, a new job, and we look forward to hearing how everything goes, to seeing pictures of your newly remodeled music room and uh, having you come back and play the organ for us every once in a while. So I know the congregation joins me in sending you their thanks and their warmest wishes. Thank you very much. Our final hymn is Our, My Country, Tis of Thee. It's number 337 in the Purple Hymns. returning no person evil for evil, but support the weak, help the afflicted, and rejoice in God's presence, as God is with you always. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of the earth, be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.